I want to talk to you today about living lives fully alive. I ran across a friend the other day that was talking about a trip he's going to take coming up in California, taking this big hike, the John Muir Trail. I think it'll take him 20 days or so. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But anyway, he'll spend a good deal of time out in this beautiful nature. I've got a few pictures here. This is not him, by the way, but a few other people taking this hike. But you see something of the beautiful nature that is out there. And it was interesting to me the words that he used to describe this upcoming hike. He said, it will be a great worship service for me. It will be a great worship service for me. And I think he could have used the language, I look forward to living li a life on that trip, especially fully alive. I thought about the words of this song, Light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Beauty has a way of making our hearts adore him. Hope of a life spent with you. And one of the great saints in the second century said, the glory of God, the glory of God is man fully alive. But often we don't live fully alive. Henry David Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I think it could have just well have, have said, the mass of men live lives about half asleep. And we want to talk about how to live lives fully alive. Tony Campolo said, while I was in graduate school, I had a Chinese professor who was a Taoist, an atheist, and had no belief in any God. One day in the midst of a classroom lecture, he looked at me and he said, you Christians, you pray all wrong. You pray, if I should die before I wake, when you should really pray, if I should wake, if I should live fully alive, I want to live fully alive before I die. The profundity of that statement has remained with me through the, through the years as I have observed so many people who are half asleep when they should be awake in Christ. Those of us who are dead are made alive. And I thought about this recently on December 29th of last year for me recording today, that's just about a month ago. Uh, I was uh, coming home from a visit to my, to my daughter and I was in the airport there in Springfield, Missouri and I got a notification on, on my phone. I'm part of the local search and rescue and the notification talked about a 74-year-old Alzheimer's patient who had left home about 8.30 in the morning. By sundown, she had not come home. And now I got this talk text about six or seven in the evening saying that we were called out on a mission to go look for her. Of course, I couldn't go that, that night. There was a group that did go, go that night. But I didn't get home until about two in the morning and didn't really feel like getting up the next morning. But I kept thinking about that 74-year-old Alzheimer's patient out in the cold, out in the desert. It would have been in the, in the 20s that, that night. And so I set an alarm at six or so in the morning and met with my group and we got out there and thank the Lord, after an hour or two, we were able to find her. And I remember driving home, having this strong sense of feeling like I am fully alive. And I don't know too much about your life, but there's not much in my life that leaves me feeling that way. That leaves me feeling, and I thought about what, what is that feeling I have? And the first thought I had was, there, there's a feeling that there's something that matters here. I love my life, but truth be told, my life is a little bit boring. And truth be told, I like it that way. People often ask me, you know, how, how you doing? And I will sometimes say, you know what? My life is a little boring. Not a lot of drama in my life, but truth is, I like it that way. But there was something about the adventure of doing something that matters, about thinking about this 74-year-old lady, not quite old enough to be my mama. I thought about my mama, though, and I thought about many of the ladies at our church who would be about, about that age. And I thought about her huddling out on a field somewhere, hugging her. Her, her dog and, and, and thinking about that, that she surely would not survive many nights out there. And there was a feeling of being fully alive because, because I had a mission that matters. And the second thing that occurred to me about that is that I not only had a mission that matters, I was also a part of a team. And I tried to imagine if I'd gotten that notification somehow when I was in Springfield the night before in the airport. I wouldn't have gotten up if I were not part of a team. And I'm a part of the local team that I'm, that I'm a part of, my local search and rescue. And there's actually two or three different gr groups there in Las Cruces. And we work under the auspices of the state p police. And there's, there's other organizations that, that, that we work with and are called upon for, 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 from time to time. And because I'm part of a team, I was motivated to go out there and help. And I believe this is one of the things that the Christian faith does for us as believers. It gives to us a mission that matters, and it gives to us a team to be a part of. Let's look at our passage today.
Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. And one thing that's not completely clear in the English is that all of the verbs in this passage, they're all plural. In other words, go is you all go. You go as a group. You go as a team. You go and make disciples. All of you go and all of you make disciples of all nations. And just by the way, this is not really our topic for the, for the day, but the main verb in this passage is that verb right there, make disciples. And the other verbs are actually participles. And because of this, I've heard preachers say that uh, they have lesser force. And I've heard one people, per, uh, preacher say, for example, that we could actually translate this, being as you're going anyway, make disciples. My Greek professor taught me that that is actually not right. He taught me that the participles receive imperative force from the main verb. And it is, in fact, right to say, go, intentionally go. Just as I intentionally went to find this lady who was lost out of the desert, we are to intentionally go and go after the lost. But the point I want to draw out, out is that we're told to do that as a group. You all go. You all make disciples of all nations. You all baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You all teaching them to obey. And let me just pause and say to you, teacher, it's not teaching them to be smarter sinners. It's not just educating them. It's teaching them how to obey. It's teaching them how they can live the obedient Christian life, the disciples life teaching them, all of you, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, in the context of this, as you are about the business of making disciples, I will be with all of you always to the very end of the age. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And this is from God who reconciled us, all of us as a team, to himself through Christ and gave to all of us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself and Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to all of us the message of reconciliation. We together, therefore, are Christ ambassadors as though it is almost as if God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We as a team implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I want to throw in one more passage, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9. What, after all, is Apollos and what is Paul? We are all only servants, a group of servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each one his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So he talks in this passage about two steps in making disciples, planting and watering. And if we think about it for just a second, we realize there's some other steps as well. There's harvesting and there's preparing the soil. And missiologists who have looked at this have seen quite a number of steps. There is no awareness of God, which moves to some awareness of God, which moves to contact with Christians, which moves to interest in Jesus which moves to investigating Jesus. I ran across a guy in the hills the other day and I got to talking about the Christian faith just a bit. And he said, I told him I wrote Bible study lesson for a living. He said, well, let me, let, let, let me ask you a question. And I asked a question about the witch of Endor. And I said, I actually don't know all that much about that. But I, want, I, I said to him, if you're, if you're curious about finding out in the Christian faith, I, wouldn't, I, I, I applaud you for reading the Bible, but I wouldn't actually start there. I would start in one of the gospels. And uh, they said, uh, he said, uh, what, what are the Gospels? And that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'd start with Matthew. In fact, I'd start in the second chapter of, of Matthew. And uh, that's the teaching about Jesus. And uh, he seemed very open and receptive to that idea. And the point is, I moved him from, I, I hope that day, interest in Jesus to investigating about Jesus. If he reads the gospel, he will come to grasp truths about Jesus. He will understand the implication of truth about Jesus he will accept the Christian truth. He will accept the implications of what it means to become a Christian. And my prayer is that he will make a decision to surrender his life to Christ. After he does so, he will gain confidence in his decision. He will gain a assurance of his salvation. He will experience change in his life. 
He will learn the basics of the Christian faith, Christian theology. He will learn Christian disciplines to start his day with his Bible on his lap, to learn to sharing his faith with others, to serve others in ongoing growth. But my question about this chart here is, think about those 16 things there and ask the question, think about the question, which step is, of these 16 is fulfilling the Great Commission? Which step is fulfilling the Great Commission? And if you're thinking rightly, you would say all of us. And that is what Paul is saying. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and there's a whole lot of steps in here. And whatever you can do to move someone up the ladder of spiritual maturity from not knowing about God at all to become a missionary in Christ, to becoming a fully formed disciple of Christ, anything you can do to move people along that line is a good thing. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants, and the one who waters, and the one who harvests, and the one who tills the soil, they all have one purpose, and they will all be rewarded according to their own labors. You are co-workers. You have a great mission. We are going to live lives fully alive because we have a mission that matters, and also because we have a team to be a part of. The mission is to make disciples of all nations. And let's look briefly. I would encourage you to ask your group, what is a disciple? And you might turn to three verses uh, that speak to us about what a disciple is. The first one is John 8, 31. And you'd ask the question, what do we learn about what it means to be a disciple from this verse? To the Jews who had believed him. So is Jesus talking to believers or unbelievers? To believers, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if it's going to be true of you and not true of some of you, if you hold to my teaching, could be translated, if you are at home in my teaching, if you are in my teaching so regularly that it feels like an old pair of slippers, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. And we learn from this verse that a disciple is one who holds to the teaching of the word of God and is particularly to the teachings of Jesus. Secondly, we learn John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if... You're my disciples if you not only hold to Jesus' teaching, but if you love one another. One more verse, John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be, if you bear much fruit, if you're characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and I think we might could throw in humility and gratitude and a few, a few others. If you are characterized by much fruit, then you are disciples. And Jesus told us to work together to go and make these people. Now, a question I've gotten in the habit of asking in, in recent years is to ask the question, and what else does the Bible say? And in this case, I want to ask the question, how else is this mission described? Jesus described it here as make disciples, but it's not the only way he described it. And I want to look at what was the mission that Jesus and the early apostles set out to accomplish? I get this question from John Orberg, and let me look at a few verses with you that describe this mission in a slightly different way. Matthew 3, 2, this is talking about John the Baptist, and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He began his most important and famous and longest sermon. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, roughly, blessed are the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He taught us to pray, hallowed be your name, and then your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And then he described for us what it meant for your kingdom to come. Your kingdom come means your will be done on earth as your will is done is heaven. He taught us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and promised us that as we do, do so, all these things will be given to us as well. He sent his disciples out. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. In the book of Acts, we read, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs. I love that saying that goes, we cannot prove the existence of God beyond all doubt, but we can prove it beyond reasonable doubt. And Jesus gave many convincing proofs, not only of the existence of God so much, but proofs that he was alive. 
He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Skipping down a bit, and when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. And we read about Paul. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. And then the very last verse in the book of Acts, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord. And so I ask you again, what was the mission? What was the gospel message that Jesus and the early disciples proclaimed? And it was this message, message about the kingdom of God is coming. And the point is that everything matters. This world is going to become a little bit more like heaven, and I want you to help. This is the mission he has given us, to make disciples of all nations and to help to usher in the kingdom to help to partner with God in making thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as thy will is done in heaven. That is our mission, and I would argue it is a mission that matters, and we can live fully alive in part because we have a mission that matters. We have not only a mission that matters, we have a team to work with. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And let me make three observations about our team that we're a part of. The first is we have a long history, a long history of winning. It started with that little group of 12 people. It's now two billion plus strong, and it has a long history of winning. We have not only a long history of winning, we have a promise that we will win. Jesus said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church in the gates of Hades. The defensive weapons of the enemy will not be able to resist the advancement of the kingdom of God. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. And thirdly, our team has a place for everyone. And I go back to this word picture of my search and rescue, and pretty much all I do on the team is, is, is walk. The guy we rode over there with has a real nice truck and has an ATV and he rode around in that ATV. The group that actually found the lady were on horseback and they had that, that tool. And whatever tools, whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever personality you have, God can use you to help the advancement of the king, to help with the advancement of the kingdom of God. Whether you are a planter or a waterer or a harvester or a soil preparer, God can use you in the advancement of the kingdom of God. In summary, we have a mission. The mission matters. The mission is to get people to heaven and to make this world more like heaven. The mission will be accomplished. There will be seasons of progress and seasons of retreat. You are part of that team and you are to do what you can to help the team succeed. And this is life. This is living life fully alive, to embrace that vision, to embrace that mission, and to realize you are part of the team. And may God richly bless you as you call your people to embrace the vision and to be a part of your team of making disciples in your part of the world.